So look for him. And now I just want to introduce our special guest, our good friend, Whitney Negebauer, who is the director of a really great group called Whale Scout. She'll tell you a little bit more about it, but they do some really important work. Um, They help restore salmon habitat on behalf of whales. And as I know many of you know, the Southern resident orcas, who we've talked about a lot in these events, are endangered. There are only 73 of them. And the main reason they're endangered is because their main food, salmon, is not doing very well. So what Whale Scout does is they actually involve people in helping to restore salmon habitat on behalf of the whales so that they have some food to eat. So Whitney will talk to you about what Whale Scout does and a little bit about salmon and why they are super cool. So thanks so much, Whitney, for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to see all of you Zoomers from all over the place. It's really exciting to be here. I mentioned that I am from Bothell today. So I'm in Washington state and I am near, actually not saltwater, not the Salish Sea, not the open ocean, but I am more close to um, small rivers and streams. And, you know, I have always loved orcas. As a little kid, I thought that they were just great. I learned about them in books. I went up to the San Juan Islands to see them, and I totally fell in love with orcas. And um, when I grew up, I knew I wanted to spend my time helping them. And the more and more I learned about it, and the more I learned about myself, and I thought of ways that I could help, I decided that the way I wanted to help orcas was to help uh, make sure they had enough food to eat, to make sure they had enough salmon. So I started learning as much as I could about salmon and the ways that I could help in my community here in Bothell. So um, I have a presentation today and it's called 10 Reasons Salmon Are Almost As Cool As Orcas because, well, orcas are really cool. Um, We could do a a quick little poll if you just raise your hand. How many of you, by raising your hand, think orcas are the coolest? A lot of hands up. A lot of hands up. How many of you guys think salmon are the coolest? Lots of hands up, too. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I am today. Everyone has their own opinion. And I might try to change your opinion if you think uh, salmon aren't so cool. I'm going to share some really interesting facts about them and, uh, and, and maybe change your mind. Maybe not. So the first reason that I think that salmon are really cool is that they are so colorful. When they are out in the ocean where orcas might be eating them, they're a beautiful shimmery silver color. And then, as we're going to learn, when they go back to fresh water, when they're adults and they go to spawn, they change all sorts of beautiful colors, like this green and red sockeye um, and uh, almost orangey colors. And another salmon turns almost like a green and a purple color. Oh, here's some more sockeye. This isn't a river near my house called the Sammamish River. And these are chum salmon, which guess what? Orcas also eat. And they turn this almost purpley and green color. Um, it's, it's really amazing. And the salmon, if you've ever seen maybe your parents eating salmon, is, there, is, there, is the meat, is it white? Like chicken? Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's like a pink color, isn't it? And it's a pink color because of basically these pigments that are in the food that they eat, like shrimp, right? And it's uh, the the same thing that makes carrots orange, makes salmon, makes makes their flesh pink. And then when they go back to fresh water, they change all these beautiful colors and the pigments um, are go out towards their skin to change their colors. And if you if you go out and you look at a salmon that maybe has spawned and has died, all that pigment has come out of its flesh and, and, and it's almost white. It's just really, really neat. Here's another sockeye. That's the kind of salmon we have in the freezer. The kind of Another reason that salmon are really cool is that they live in salt water and fresh water. 
And I think a lot of you guys knew that in the, in the poll. Um, so here's some Chinook salmon. Oop, I like the Chinook. This is the orca's favorite food and it's got spots. Do you see the spots? You can see it in the picture too. These are um, um, the biggest. That's why the orcas probably like them. People also like to eat them a lot too. Um, there's a special word for when salmon or other fish go from salt water to fresh water. Does anyone know what that word is? Any guesses? If you know, raise your hand. Maybe not. It's a tricky vocabulary word. I'll share some vocabulary words with you. This word is called anadromous. Anadromous. And it means that they go from freshwater to salt water. Can orcas go from freshwater to salt water? Are they anadromous? Uh-uh. No. They can they can spend a little bit of time in freshwater, but they really do a lot better in salt water, right? Our salmon, especially these big Chinook salmon, they can spend up to six years in the ocean and then go all the way back to freshwater where they were born to spawn. So here's a map. So here we are down here in Washington state and the salmon come out of the rivers when they're born and they go all the way out to the ocean and they can go really, really far. Uh, it's an amazing migration. And then they return all the way back to the rivers where they were born. So I thought, you know, my salmon friend here can go all the way out. They can go swim as far as another country from Washington state to Canada, up to Alaska. They can go very, very far. It would be like if we were to fly in an airplane, it would take hours to reach there. And you can think of like a little salmon trying to get all the way there. Um, that's an amazing, amazing journey. Salmon help create forests. So their bodies, when they return to fresh water and they spawn and they lay their eggs, they, um, that's the end of their life. And when they die, their body is on the stream bank and sometimes other animals might pull it up into the forest and their body has so many nutrients like carbon and nitrogen and it acts literally like a fertilizer to help grow trees. And those trees will grow tall and they will help shade the stream and help protect their babies right where they laid their eggs. So it's really amazing that you can think that, um, that salmon from the ocean are helping our forests all the way inland. So this is probably a good time to talk about the salmon life cycle, which is kind of what you did in, in your bracelets, is you learned about the salmon life cycle. And I've been talking about it a little bit. So we can start here at the top. And at the top of this picture, these are adult salmon. They're, they're big and they're living in the ocean. They might be caught by a fisherman. They might be caught by an orca. And then they, um, so if you go down to the right, kind of like you're following like a clock, they enter into the rivers. And then from the rivers, their body changes color. See how they're getting redder here? And they're getting ready to spawn. And then they find a mate here in this bottom corner and they will lay their eggs in the gravel. You can see here underneath them. Then their bodies, they will die and they will um, leave their eggs there. And the eggs out of the gravel, they will hatch. And you can see a cool picture here and I'll show another one. Attached to their tummy is a little yolk sack. And one of my teachers told me once that their moms pack their lunch with them, with the babies, right? They weren't gonna be around, so they pack their lunch. And that yolk sac helps feed the salmon when they're living in the gravel and they're just teeny tiny. And then once they get a little bit bigger, then they emerge from the gravel and they come up and they live in the stream for a while before um, entering the ocean because they wanna get really big and really strong because there's a lot of other predators out there in the ocean. And then after a few years, they're adults again, and the cycle starts all over again. All right, here we go. Salmon can climb mountains. Who believes me? 
Who thinks that's true? Couple of you, maybe. Who thinks that's not true? Yeah, maybe. All right. Well, they kind of do. I wanted to share this to, to, to share with you that the salmon, some of their rivers go up into high elevations and they can uh, travel about 950 miles up a river and sometimes more than 6,000 feet in elevation. That's 10 space needles stacked on top of each other. That's pretty high. And these fish can swim all the way back up there, all the way up to go back to their home river where they were born and to spawn. They can also jump up huge waterfalls, uh, up 12 feet is the record for how far out of the water they can jump to climb up all these steep uh, barriers and rocks to get back to their, to their stream where they were born. So that would be like if you as a kid could jump up over two basketball hoops to do like a massive slam dunk. That's really, really high. That's some amazing jumping skills. And that I think makes salmon really cool. And oh yeah, here's another uh, cool fact that the, the Latin name for salmon comes from salmo, which means to leap. All right, salmon are really cool because they have so many babies. You can hold up your finger. How many babies do orcas have at a time? How many? One, two, three, five. I see a lot of ones. Five, I see a five, I see another four. So orcas, they pretty much have one baby, right? Maybe they have more in their lifetime, but they have one at a time. Um, whereas salmon, a Chinook salmon, they can lay up to 5,000 eggs, like a really big Chinook salmon, up to 5,000 eggs. And each of these red dots, hey, check that out, red dots, right? Just like the salmon color, it's the same pigment that makes their eggs red too. Um, and they lay them in the gravel. Now this is a picture, um, uh, normally in a, in a real stream, there'd be gravel on top and they wouldn't let, leave them on, um, on the surface of the gravel, but they would bury them to stay safe inside the gravel. Um, let's see, oh, and here's that cool yolk sack. Um, that's their lunch. That's their food that they eat until they're big enough, until they're strong enough to get all the way out of the gravel. And out of all those eggs, not very many of them survive. Only about one in a thousand. So maybe like, I don't know, three to five of them would actually go through their entire life cycle, through that whole chart, and then be able to come back to a river, to a stream, to spawn right where they were born. So where do all those other babies go? Well, they probably are eaten when they're little by a bird or a bigger fish, they're caught out in the ocean, they're eaten by an orca, it, you know, anything can happen. So uh, it, it's really cool that salmon can have so many babies, because they need to. And those babies are not only they're feeding the ecosystem, um, but still having a, a handful come back and replace that one salmon or that those two salmon as a pair, that's really impressive. So about one in a thousand. So I put up a bunch of dots and that one in a circle is about all that will survive to make a new nest um, at the end of their life cycle. All right, salmon can grow huge teeth. Now I know orcas also have really cool teeth, right? Because they're eating big prey, like the, some of our, our orcas are eating salmon, like in this picture, and some of them are eating marine mammals. And so they have really big, strong teeth, right? They, that is really cool. But there's something cool about, about the, the, the salmon and their teeth. And that is that their teeth can go from one size most of their life and then as soon as they go back to fresh water, all of a sudden they grow really, really big. And it's not because they're eating, it's actually because a lot of the males are using them to fight 
and they're using them and they're fighting to try to get in the best position to find the best mate. And so uh, that's why they have these really big teeth. And I made an example of what it would be like. All right, this is my friend. This is us as a human, see? These are our teeth. And then we can imagine that all of a sudden our teeth get three times as big. Are you ready for this? Here's what it would look like. Whoa, that's really big. That's really big. Okay. Salmon are super navigators. Do you think that they use a map? Shake your head yes or no. Do they use a map? No, they obviously don't use a map. They use an iPhone, right? To use their GPS to figure out where to go back home. No, they don't use an iPhone either. Oh, okay. Salmon go all the, all the way out to the ocean, right? And they have to figure out where they're going to get all the way back to the stream where they were born. And sometimes even from there, that's another 900 miles away. So how do they know where they're going? Well, they use the Earth's magnetic field like a compass. And they're able to tell on a large scale sort of where to go. And then once they get close, get this, they use their nose to smell their way home. And they have an amazing sense of smell. In fact, their sense of smell is a thousand times better than a dog. So maybe you've heard of Eva, the, the, the scat sniffing dog. Well, she's got a really amazing nose, but salmon actually have an even better sense of smell. So I set up this little contest here. If there was a giant leaf pile and there were a few grains of rice in that leaf pile and, then we, and a dog and a salmon were trying to sniff out who could smell for those grains of rice. The grains of rice here next to the dog are pretty small in that leaf pile, but there's an even teeny tiny down here on a green leaf towards the bottom right next to the salmon itty bitty tiny grains of rice. And that's how much better a salmon can smell even compared to a dog that have really amazing noses. All right, some of you maybe have orcas that live in your backyard, maybe, I probably a few of you, but probably a, a lot more people have salmon that live in their backyards. So do they actually like hang out in your grass or sit in your furniture? No, probably not. No, they don't do that. But they live maybe in the river or the stream that's pretty close to you. There's a stream by my house that I walk to and I, I look for salmon there. And it's just a short walk away. But you know what? The rain and everything that falls in my yard eventually does seep into that stream. And so I have to be very careful about the water and about what's going on in my yard to make sure that those salmon are safe. And on the map on the side, see all that pinky kind of salmon colored area on the map that goes up into Canada, all the way down to California, even into Idaho, all that area is where salmon live and where the watersheds, where the rain falls and, and seeps down into our rivers and streams where salmon live, those are all important areas. And that means that we can help the salmon in our own backyard too. And that's what I think is really cool. All right, salmon are an important food for some people and for some cultures. So, uh, you know, back before there was grocery stores here, um, the people who originally lived here, um, you know, Native Americans and First Nations, uh, salmon were really, really important to them. And they were able to catch salmon and smoke them and preserve them to eat all year round. And um, the fish were also important in their culture and in their ceremonies. You can see this through their art. This is a picture of a, a kokanee salmon, which is a salmon, oh, guess what? It actually only lives in fresh water. It's called a kokanee. And it looks like just like a sockeye, but it's a lot smaller. And, um, and, and those kokanee salmon are very, very important to the Snoqualmie tribe. Uh, and the number 10 reason is that salmon feed orcas. 
and they're so important to help feed our endangered orcas. You know, between all the three pods through J-pod, K-pod, and L-pod, those are the three family groups that make up the southern resident orcas that live on the west coast here. They need about a thousand salmon every day um, just, to, just to make it by. So that's a lot of fish that they need out in the water and that they need to be able to catch, to eat every single day. 1,000 of these guys, that's a lot. And, you know, salmon are also important food for so many more creatures, more than, than, than just orcas. There's also, you know, bears and raccoons and seals. Maybe in the end, you guys can share some other animals that depend on eating salmon. Um, our orcas are sort of special and that's basically the only food that they eat. You know, even bears and things like that, they're eating berries and, and other things. So um, that's what makes salmon special too. I wanted to share um, a little bit about what we do at Whale Scout. We think orcas are cool and we think salmon are almost as cool. And so we go out and we do things, we get our hands dirty, we help plant those trees that shade the rivers to keep the water cool, to keep the babies nice and cool and safe, to provide the homes for the insects to fall into the stream so that those um, young salmon have something to eat to get big and strong before going out to the ocean. So uh, we do a lot of work on the Sammamish River, which is connected to Lake Washington and then goes out um, to Puget Sound and the Salish Three through the Ballard Locks. And so we do a lot of work at a place that used to be a golf course and is now a park. And it's got a lot of shoreline habitat. And it's where Chinook salmon, sockeye, and coho uh, swim through on their way to their spawning ground. So keeping it healthy and happy is really important. So we're a part of this big effort Orca Salmon Month, Orca Recovery Day. And I wanted to share an opportunity that we're doing in Bothell. And we are going to be, we're not gonna be planting because it's been so hot here, but we're gonna be getting ready to plant. We're gonna prep each hole. We're gonna take off. I'll show you a picture of the site. Um, see how it's mostly grass? There's a lot of big open grassy areas and just a few trees along the river. And we are gonna be planting trees along that grassy area. So first what we're gonna do is take out that grass and in a circle where each hole will go. And the reason why we do that is because um, one, it's easier to dig. And two, that grass sucks up so much water away from our, our native trees and plants. And so we're gonna take that grass out of the way so it doesn't compete as much which will be tricky because that grass has been there for about 90 years. And um, yeah, so it's gonna be a really challenging uh, project. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And we're engaging a lot of volunteers and a lot of youth to, do, um, to help us do it. So that's on October 15th. You can sign up at whalescout.org. And I look forward to hearing all of your super great questions and, um, and, 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 hearing about this. Oh my goodness, Whitney, thank you so much. I learned lots of things. <laughs> that was awesome. We did have one question in the chat. Let me get to it from Eric, who always asks really good questions. Um, can salmon travel to Siberia and Japan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are some salmon runs that originate, you know, in, in Russia, um, in the far east, and then they have their own travel patterns and then return back to those natal um, streams as well. Awesome. And anybody else, if, if you had questions, you could just unmute and ask them now if you wanted to. Or raise your hand and we can call on you too. No questions? Did Whitney just do such a great job that you have <laughs> all the answers now? Oh. Oh, yep. Lillian, Clara, and Willa. Go ahead and unmute. How many salmon types are there? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in the Pacific, oh, this is actually fun. I can show you a cool thing. In the, in the Pacific, we have a fun way to remember um, our salmon. 
and I'll start this one. The pink is the pinky and the um, silver salmon, it goes on your ring finger, right? Like you would have a ring, like a silver ring. It's also called uh, coho salmon. And then right here is the king, the tallest finger, which we also call the Chinook. Oop, that's that guy. And then here, this one I don't like. We need to redo this one. This one's your pointer finger and it's for the sock eye. Like I'll sock you in the eye, but don't do that, right? That's horrible. <laughs> and then this one, your thumb is for chum because it rhymes. So that's a good way to remember the five. Oh, Caleb and Emma, it looks like. Thank you. You can unmute. There you go. Um, how fast can uh, salmon swim? Ooh. Like how many miles per hour? That's a great question. Whew. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, maybe someone else here knows. There are some really cool videos of salmon trying to outswim orcas. And, um, and they, they can swim quite fast, right? If an orca is chasing you, you can really hustle. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Cindy, do you know? I don't, I'm looking it up. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> And it looks like Eric had a, um, a follow-up. So could salmon from go from Mexico all the way to Ind Indonesia, or can they travel that long of a distance? Hmm. That's a long way. That is a very long way. I think that may be, uh, I don't know, I'd have to do the math. That's pretty far. Um, typically they're going to be in colder waters. A lot of the times when they go out from their river, They'll turn right and they'll go north where it's cooler. And in those more cold uh, waters, there's more food for them. So typically they'll do that. And sometimes they'll do a few circles up there and then come back. That's more kind of the, the trend that we see. Awesome. Anybody else? You're asking great questions. Walter, go ahead, bud. I'm gonna plant some trees also. You're gonna what? I'm gonna plant trees for Orca Day. Oh, for Orca Day. Okay. that's wonderful. That's awesome. Me with my funny ears, I thought you said eat some cheese. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Which also <laughs> sounds good. <funny. laughs> but planting trees is awesome. That's very cool, Walter. So I did find something, I don't know how accurate this is, but it says that um, some salmon can swim 1.4 miles per hour, but they can do little bursts of seven miles per hour. Mm. But I don't know how accurate that is. That was just one thing that I found. We will have to do a little bit more research on that, let you guys know. Yeah, I believe that. And from, I think they could swim even faster than that if they really had to. Um, that's really cool. Maybe it depends on the type of salmon too. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of those pictures of the ones that were jumping, those are coho salmon. They, they're good jumpers. Um, and, and some are like, they're sockeye, not known for jumping skills. They like lakes, right? You don't got to jump much in a lake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you guys are asking great questions today. Any, any else? Colin, did I see your hand up? I have some math for, for us. So this is 10 blocks of, so this is 10 and this is 10 blocks. So if you would, so 900 would be this technically. Well, yeah, so nine. There's there's ten of these. Wait, I must do that. <laughs> so if so, there's nine. There's nine hundred. Technically, if you kind of multiply it, and and there's and this one would be the one salmon to survive. Yeah. 
I see where you're going with that. You're trying to do the math, right? To figure out if I have this many blocks and they each represent a salmon, how many will come, will make it through their full life cycle and back to, to spawn where they were born. And you're right, it's about one out of a thousand. So if there's a big Chinook that has 5,000 eggs, about five will come back. And you know what? That seems like a really low number, right? That's like very surprising to hear that. But when you think about it, it's, you know, I'll show you my two, but if these two were to have a nest, right? And 5,000, and then they were all to go out and then come back. Well, you'd hope at least two made it, right? To replace these two. And then if five make it, there's actually three more that would help grow that population. So that's pretty good. You know, you gotta think about it in another way too. And all those babies help feed all these other animals and people along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can um, improve the habitat and improve all of those conditions, then more can make it back and their populations can grow and grow and grow. That's a really tricky math question. Maybe you could work on the blocks on that one too. Awesome. Oh, when I see Aaron, you've had your hand up for a while. See? Go ahead, Al. Um, uh, how long can salmon live? Mm, that's a good question. I saw, um, I saw on your, um, your, your bracelet kit it said um, that they can spend about six years out in the ocean and then come back. And I was doing some research last night and I saw that some can live even up to eight years. Um, so that, that was surprising to me. I didn't think they could live quite that long. Um, but you know, the, the older that they get, the more that they eat. And, um, and so like the older that they are, right? So you can get some really, really, really big salmon that way. And Lillian, Clara, and Mola, I see your hand up. How big can the babies get and how fast do they grow? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the babies start off really tiny, right? They come out of the eggs and they're living in the gravel. They're really tiny, you know, they're only like itty bitty this big. And then um, it, it kind of depends on the, the kind of salmon. Some of them, they come out of the gravel and phew, they're out towards the ocean. Other ones will spend more time hanging out in the stream, getting really, really big before they go all the way out to the ocean. Then they're about, I don't know, yay big, a lot of them. Sometimes if you live in the Seattle area, you can go to the Ballard Locks, which is where when, um, you know, fresh water comes in into salt water. And because we have changed our ecosystem so much, they have these locks, which are like, it's kind of like a dam and a boat elevator to bring the boats from fresh water up to, or from salt water up into fresh water, because the fresh water is actually higher than the salt water. So they have to have a boat elevator bring them down. And to help the salmon get through, they have a ladder. And underneath, underground, they have these windows. And you can look at through the windows to see the fish leaving fresh water and going to salt water. And in summer, late summer, early fall, some of the ones that are returning from the, um, from the ocean back to fresh water. And sometimes you see them crossing paths and you see the little guys heading out to ocean. And then you see the big guys coming back to spawn in their fresh water. So that's kind of cool to see and to see the comparisons. And it's really cool if you live in the Seattle area to be able to go do that, um, to see the salmon up close. And you can look at those big adults and say, oh my gosh, you are one in a thousand and you are coming back. You are amazing. Think about all the stories that salmon could tell, all the experiences out in the ocean, running away from orcas and our fishermen and all those other bigger fish in the sea. And, and it's so special to see the ones that have made it and have been so strong to come all the way back to fresh water. It's really exciting. All right. So if you have any questions that pop up after this, you can email them to me and I will make sure that Whitney or somebody <laughs> gets you a good answer too. Um, but we are gonna play a video right now and then end it with our little um, bracelet activity, okay?
So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this video for a minute. It's just about a four minute video, but it's really great because it shows the work that Whitney is doing with Whale Scout. So we did a project called Salmon Stories, where each video is sort of telling the story of people and their relationship with salmon and why salmon is important to them. And so for one of these salmon stories, we highlighted Whitney and Whale Scout. And if you remember that project that she was telling you about that they're doing for Orca Recovery Day, where they're going to be planting some trees there, before they planted the trees, they had to remove all these blackberries, which can be really bad for these rivers and for salmon. So she was doing these restoration projects where she had volunteers coming out and helping to remove the blackberries and getting all of this ready for the planting that she's going to be starting to do. So this is just a little four minute video to talk a little bit about Whale Scout and about this project that she's been working on. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hi, my name is Whitney Negebauer and I'm the director of Whale Scout. Um, our organization is dedicated to protecting Pacific Northwest whales through land-based conservation experiences. So we started off doing land-based whale watching in the Puget Sound area, connecting people in the Seattle and Tacoma area with whales, specifically the Southern resident killer whales. But then we realized very quickly that just watching them was truly not enough. So we quickly pivoted to including salmon habitat restoration so that we can help ha the salmon, which of course feed our southern resident killer whales. So that's what we're doing here today. We are located right now in the city of Bothell, which is pretty far away from Puget Sound, but the Sammamish River is here in our backyard and it's home to Chinook coho and sockeye salmon and so by helping the salmon here we're helping our orcas out in Puget Sound and beyond throughout the whole Pacific Northwest. Here in the Sammamish River when the Chinook salmon are migrating through the water is too hot for salmon and they can get sick, they can get stressed out, they can even die. So what we're doing here is helping keep the waters really clean and clear and cool to help the salmon. So ever since I was a kid, I've always been totally obsessed with whales. I don't know what it is, but I've always been so fond of them. I first learned about whales through books and through documentary films. Only much later did I actually see a whale in the wild. Um, and so, yeah, restoring habitat and protecting where I live so that it benefits the whales is really important to me. I just feel like Whatever I can do, wherever I am, is important for the whales and um, bringing other people into it because there's a lot of other people out there that also care very deeply about the environment. And so, you know, a lot of the volunteers that we have here today also are you know, big time whale lovers, but some of them are just local people that, um, that appreciate whales, but uh, are also just really interested in helping the environment here where they live in their hometown. And so if we can also draw the connections, it just gives greater purpose to the work that we're doing here. Helping nature's fun. Knowing that you help make that place a better place for, for those salmon to live and to spawn and to grow the next generation, you know, it's, it's hard to describe. It's just, it feels really, really good. And to see right beneath your feet what you're trying to support and protect, um, it just really warms your heart and seeing that, that the orca's food is living and thriving right where we are um, is just so cool. My favorite part about today I think was getting that snag out. I just can't stop staring at it. It's just so cool to see like visible change. It, my favorite part of the day was doing the mulch at the end. It was sort of half, put, a, put a nice little finishing touch on to show what exactly we did in the uh, my favorite part of the day was two things. Uh, first thing was meeting a bunch of new people in new space. And then the second was seeing the finished product, like the huge dent that we made. I guess it was pretty awesome. So to me, salmon are like the lifeblood of everything in the Pacific Northwest. They're the lifeblood of the orcas. And they're also just like a, a sign that where we are is okay. And that, that where we're living is, is safe and it's clean and it's going to sustain all of us. Um, so seeing the salmon return and knowing that they're there and knowing that they're okay sort of makes me feel like we're going to be okay. Yay, 
My I'm name is Doc. I'm a research biologist uh, with Wild Orca. This is Eva, Eva the whale dog. And she... Sorry. <laughs> Got to hit the stop button there. <laughs> that was a great video. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks. So yeah, that was sort of what what things look like in the winter during the pandemic, and what we what it looks like now is very different. You know, hot and sunny, and very dry, very brown. Um, so yeah, it'll be exciting to be able to add more native trees and shrubs there. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that. Well, thanks for being here. And I want to real quick um, let everybody know who's close to Whidbey that we are also celebrating Orca Recovery Day this Saturday. So if you can't get to Bothell, this is another option. We are doing a beach cleanup at Double Bluff Beach at 3.30. And you can stop in the Whale Center all day on Saturday if you're nearby and make a, an Orca pledge, which is also part of Orca Recovery Day. All right, so I think... Actually, I wanted to see a show of hands. How many of you already made your bracelets? Anybody or were you saving them? I, I see some in the videos. I, do. I see some, some, some in the that. DC family. Yeah. Did you guys already make your bracelets? No? All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is what, if you have gotten your, your kit, what it, would, what it came with, the instructions. And if not, um, you can still get one, like I said. Um, so basically these bracelets today are just to um, help you remember facts about salmon and also how we can help protect the salmon. So you got a little pipe cleaner with your kit. So what you're gonna do is just go down the list and put your beads on your pipe cleaner. I am actually going to stop screen sharing so that I can show you guys what I'm doing. Um, but the first one right here is the light blue that you're going to string on. So you should have a lighter blue. It's the lightest blue of the ones you got because we got a couple of directions. So pull it all the way through your bracelet. And this one represents that salmon need fresh water, fresh, clean water. It's a really important thing. We talked about that a lot today. And then once you have that one on, your second bead is the clear bead. And you're gonna push that one all the way down your pipe cleaner. And that one symbolizes that salmon also need icy cold water because cold water has more oxygen. And that's where those, uh, those habitats around the rivers and the streams come in really important because that shade keeps the water cool. So the next one, is a, is a brown, yes, sorry, can't read my own writing. <laughs> so find your brown and you're gonna put that one on. And you had a, probably had a couple different versions. We had a beige and a brown, so make sure it's your darker brown. And that one symbolizes that females lay their eggs in gravel, not sandy bottoms. So the gravel protects their eggs. All right, are you guys keeping up? Or do I need to slow down a little bit? Are you good? You can let me know. You can you can unmute and tell me uh, that I'm going too fast too. So the next one is your orange bead. Put that on your bracelet. And that one is about how a group of salmon eggs is called a red. One female egg, just like Whitney was talking about, can lay about 3,000 to 4,000, and it sounds like up to 5,000 eggs. <laughs> which is just a crazy amount, especially when we were looking at Colin's math over there. Now grab your tan. So that was the lighter brown one or beige. And that one is about how eggs hatch into alevin with a yolk sac attached to its belly to provide food. And I love that description of um, mom packing lunch with them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, the next one green sparkle, which was like the, the see-through green, if you got that one. Um, that one is about olivine grow into fry and develop par marks. Am I saying par right? All right. 
And these marks help them hide among the stream plants to avoid becoming someone's food, which would be another reason that all that habitat around the streams and the rivers would be really important so for the camouflage, right? Ooh, Walter, did you have a question? Do you want to unmute, unmute there? Did you have a question? I like to, I also eat salmon too. Are you like an orca? <laughs> yeah, I also eat salmon. <laughs> All right, so the next one is the light green. And the light green symbolizes how fry mainly eat invertebrates. Invertebrates is a very long, another vocabulary word for um, uh, an animal that doesn't have bones, right? And so they eat invertebrates, so they need a healthy variety of insects, which also has to do with the healthy ecosystem, right guys? And then the next one, we have purple. And that symbolizes great blue herons, which may eat lots of fry while they live in the stream. So somebody else who depends on salmon. And then what's next? We got up to purple. Now we're on silver, which was the hardest bead to find to put the kits together. <laughs> so the silver says fry grow into the stage. Wait. Ooh, it left off a word on my print. The stage when they are ready to start transforming from freshwater fish to saltwater fish. What is that stage, Whitney? From when they're going from, uh, oh my gosh, I'm just, from freshwater to saltwater. Yeah. Um, well, they're smolts. I think that's probably the word that was left yeah. off there. <laughs> it's multiplication. Awesome. And then I'll give you guys just a second to catch up because I need to check something on my print. So yeah, next. I Googled it. Woo, yeah. All right. <laughs> Checking our work, right? Yeah. Even the grown ups, we got to check our work. So next is turquoise which is the pretty see-through blue one. While preparing for the ocean, smolts spend time in an estuary, which you talked about. This is an area where freshwater and saltwater meet and mix together. We have a lot of estuaries in the Salish Sea. And next we have dark blue. Smolts grow into adult salmon in the Pacific Ocean. They may stay there up to six years and can travel very far. And pink, pink is next. Adult salmon eat lots of shrimp, forage fish, and other vitamin and nutrient rich food in the ocean. Next one's my favorite one. We've got black for orcas are one of the many predators of salmon living in the ocean. Our Southern resident orcas, especially like Chinook salmon. All right, we keeping up? I'm making you do quick hands, aren't I? <laughs> but you'll have the instructions too if you don't get quite done here. So red sparkle is the next one. Spawning salmon migrate to the same stream they were born in to lay eggs. Spawning salmon change their color and their shape and only two to four fish from each red make it back to spawn. And then gold is for bears. Bears enjoy catching tasty salmon as they swim against the current and end up water, end in waterfalls. So many other animals depend on salmon. See how important they are? We only got a couple left. Okay, white is for bald eagles. Bald eagles eat salmon on their way to spawn or after the salmon spawn and die. Those are also um, scavengers, right? That's another animal that relies on salmon. Green is for healthy trees and shrubs that use the nutrients and vitamins released from the salmon's body. So the salmon also give back to the ecosystem. 
Yellow is the energy from the sun that nourishes the streamside trees and shrubs, which shade the water and help to keep it clean and cold. And then everybody got another special little charm. Everybody's were a little different and you can actually put on anything that you want as your special charm. And this is your pledge charm. And this is your promise to keep the streams healthy for the salmon. And you all got the 17 actions page. And those are just some ideas. There's even more ideas out there about how to keep your streams and rivers healthy. Did you do it? This is what mine looks like. So I'm going to wear mine on Orca Recovery Day this Saturday to help remember all of these tips. And again, if you didn't get a kit and you still want one, you can still email me and I will send one off to you. All right, anything else, guys? Well, thanks for doing this. And it was fun to watch you guys do your crafts and it was fun to share with you all. Thank you so much for coming, Whitney. Thank thanks you, Whitney. for being here, Whitney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks Hope for to see you next time. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next month. Bye. Thank you.